Now in England, we have now 58% of our children, children of English origin, not our recent immigrants, 58% who are not reading by eight and nine years of age. And this is very serious, because unless you can read, you cannot be, really be educated. You see. So this, uh, we have to think why children are not achieving reading. I think it's the same here. I know last year the results for university entrance here in reading and writing were appalling. It was in all the papers, wasn't it? This never used to be. Uh, children, uh, unless they were mentally defective, all learned to read and write. It was very rare to have a child who wasn't reading well by seven. My last class myself in a public school, I took what we call the top infants in England. We have different terms. These were the sort of uh, six and a half to eights. And they were all reading except two when they came to me. Uh, and it's nothing to do with the size of the class because I had 48 all by myself. And uh, the classes before me were 50 and 60 all to one teacher. See, classes are getting smaller, so we can't blame the classes. And in England, the first time, about 12 years ago when they did the survey, it was about 45% of the children not reading at 8, 9. And the teachers all blamed the illiterate homes. But heavens, we've had generations of education. And there's no home that is totally illiterate. I mean, maybe the... In every home, the father brings in an evening paper because he wants to read the racing results with us. And so children do see, are surrounded by people who read, and every breakfast packet, packet has writing all over it. They are in a literate environment, so we can't blame the homes. Well, now, on the other hand, we have... Uh, people nowadays who are pushing the very small children into reading and writing. And I don't know, you've had it here, but it's an American who's been all over uh, England and Ireland, spoken on television, and saying, teach your baby to read, you see. Yes, and uh, the mother wears a placard that says, mommy, and everything's labeled, and he sells you an expensive kit, but heavens above, <laughs> I mean, how does it, it's, it's so absurd, but the mothers are all buying this, you see. How do you think a baby can read the word mummy when he doesn't know that you are his mummy? <laughs> you know, he doesn't know the word mummy as a spoken language. So, but there are these people, and there are Montessorians who are giving the children, introducing the children to reading and writing too early, you see. And uh, we wouldn't think that these small children should be pressed to read and write. There are far more important things for them to be doing. Uh, and if they miss out on their sensorial education, on the exercise of practical life, the things they, that are right for the age, then that they are going to be less well prepared afterwards. See? So we must be careful to give it at the right age, but we must also be careful not to push it on the age when the children are not ready. Now, before you go into reading and writing, you have to have quite a well-developed language. The spoken, word, spoken language must come before the written language. And that should be pretty obvious. And then we must realize what a tremendously complicated thing reading and writing is. As I've said, we've only had it. Mankind has only learned to express himself in written symbols during the last 4,000 years, which is very recent in our time. And until modern times, only a very few people were expected to read and write. The ordinary people were not expected to. Even in the time of our knights, uh, very recently in English history, 
they were so busy practicing warfare and uh, so on that they did, very few of them read and wrote. You see, many of our kings didn't read and write. Um, in my well, the village where I grew up, the parish registers went back to about uh, uh, 1068, I think. Uh, they do in many, of course, in England we do have this sort of every, every village, Lenny is an old village. And it was only in very recent times that anyone getting married signed their name. See, before that they just put their mark, and only the, really the vicar and perhaps the biggest house in the parish did anyone read and write. So it's a very new thing to expect everybody to. It's a complicated thing when you think about it. You look at these marks on paper, just arbitrary symbols, and without thinking about them, you interpret these into pictures in your mind, you see? And then if you're reading aloud, you, you express them in words. It's a very complicated thing that we have learned to do, and so we mustn't expect the children to do it at too young an age. The language development has to take, have taken place. There has to be a certain maturity of the mind the eye brain development has to be complete, complete, you see, or you may do damage in, in forcing them into this written uh, word too soon. We have the, in one place we did do some definite testing. Uh, we took, there were actually some two different Montessori schools, one which began the reading and writing before we liked to begin it, and the other began when we liked to begin. And we tested the children at six, and outside psychologists came in and tested the children from the two schools. And the ones that had waited were the ones who were uh, doing better, very much better, and who were also the ones who were enjoying reading. And the ones who had begun too soon were not as well advanced, and also they were not enjoying it so much. And I had one child in uh, the school last year, because we have a school attached to the college, who had begun the sandpaper letters, say, at two and a half. And of course, you learn them very easily at that age. But by the time she was five, she didn't want to read, you see, because uh, it had been this uh, too early. You don't uh, really achieve it. So there's a time when it's right, and it, you do harm if you begin too soon. We are very much geared to think of reading, writing, and arithmetic as education. And we're not yet geared to think of sensorial education as being so important and the other sides of education, which the early child must go through. Now then, but what about, what can we do to prepare the child for reading? Are there any prerequisites? See. And here, I think, of course, if the child is in a cultural environment where there is reading and writing, then, of course, he, is, he gets his predisposition to wish to read and write. Because the child, the young child, looks at the parents and he is geared by nature to copy. Nature says, copy your, the adults, copy your parents. You see? And not only does he copy your moral behavior and your manners and many of your mannerisms and, the, and your behavior and so on, but whatever your interests are, the child gets tremendously interested in those too. In the old days, when a man's work was in his home or his village, and the children could watch him at work, the blacksmith's shop in every village, which every village had to have, the blacksmith's forge was adjoining his cottage, and the small children used to toddle in and watch him. Very soon they would be doing small things. And so always the son followed the father because he got this uh, strong urge to do what his father did. And so you've always got the son following the father's trade. But nowadays this is broken because the father goes out 
of the home to work. The children don't see the adult at work. It's often very hard for them to adapt to work because they don't see it when they're small. Very hard for them to make a choice, and of course the choice is much wider. So he copies whatever you do and whatever your interests are, he forms this predisposition to enjoy that as well. So it's, if you are in a, the children in America, all children in America or England are in a literate environment. They may, the parents may read at a very low level, as I say, they may only want to read the racing news or the scandalous tidbits in the paper. But at any rate, there's some form of reading in every home, and outside the home, the shop windows, the notices, reading, writing is everywhere, so that they do know all about it. It's not like a country where they see nothing in the way of literature. Now, it's a great help if we want our children to be cultured now, by culture, you mean the highest discipline that the race has reached. You don't mean the way of life. You don't mean supermarkets and the ordinary way of life, but you mean the highest discipline in which we have reached and the best of our literature, for example. Then we do have to be very careful with our little children because if you get anything that is cultural in the home in the first years of life, is absorbed. There's this period of the absorbent mind when they're learning by absorption rather than through language. And whatever is in the home, that is what they are geared to like. So if the home is cultured, your children will then want to read the best in literature. You see, they will want to take the highest of which we have become capable. So first, I think, in the home, we must be very careful of the books we select for our children. The Victorians, I'm a great admirer of the Victorians because I had these wonderful aunts and great aunts and uncles. And they were always very careful in their selection of reading matter for the children. <coughs> See. And I think we have to go back to looking at the reading matter which is being provided for them. We have never had so many beautiful books produced. We have color photography. We have beautiful books at a reasonable price. The books on every subject, books on every country, the books on the animals, the fishes, any subject you like, and you have, can get these very beautiful books at a moderate price. Now, the child of this age is geared to wanting to understand the world. See, he wants to know everything that, about everything he sees. He wants reality. And at a later age, when he understands reality, then he can have stories and fantasy because he knows the difference. If you went to a country that was entirely new to you and you wanted to understand the country, you wouldn't like it if people told you things that were not true and made up fanciful tales for you, you see, because you would be terribly anxious to understand this new culture and you would want fact. And this is where the children want facts. And so they will love books with real photographs, you see. And we all have our different interests. You know, some of them get fascinated by books on the animals, the fishes. And I remember when Russia sent up the first Sputnik, it was our four-year-old group who came absolutely enthused by this. They bought every newspaper cutting. They began asking questions which we couldn't answer all about light years and the planets. And, and the teacher of the foyers was kept very busy. She had to go to the library at nights and study <laughs> to keep up with these four-year-olds. And uh, she made them beautiful uh, maps of the sky and the constellations uh, and so on. 
and no time at all. And the 11-year-olds used to go down every day to visit the four-year-olds to see what was new there, <laughs> you see. And uh, last year we had one for exhibition in one of our museums on the, this world and space. And I went during the daytime, because then you don't know, at the weekend you get crowds of school children there. And all the parents with the children under school age were there. And what these four-year-olds could talk about, you know, was beyond me, not having grown up with it. See, they are fascinated. So well, this is a time to give them these very good books, mainly books of which will give them knowledge. And they will absorb far more than we think. Now, from the very beginning in the home, there must be this respect for books. You see, it is wonderful that we can hand on knowledge, you see, and therefore and it's wonderful that people can write these beautiful books. You see, really good ones. Take these lovely photographs. So books should be treated with respect. And if you're going to have children using them in a nursery school, a Montessori school, or in the home, they should, from the beginning, be shown how to handle the book properly. They should always use the book on the table. A child at a year and a half can learn to t turn the pages properly, you see. And so they grow up with this feeling for literature, for books, for knowledge. And what they, as I say, what you give them in those early years is something that they will keep for life. Now, we can read to them a little, but like everything, don't overdo it. Some of us read to our children far too much as a way of keeping them quiet. See? And uh, if we read them nonsense, we're only doing them harm. See? You read to them, I don't, say don't, I don't take anything to extremes. Read to them, but read to them a little. See? And look at books with them, but not, don't overdo it. So we don't want to overdo it. What is almost, it is important that we read lot of books with them and get them to enjoy books with us, but practically, but possibly almost more important is that we read for our own edification in front of the children. See, if the father comes home at night and after having played with his children and so on, he says, uh, well, now I want to read, so you be quiet for a little while. The children see this as something important to the father. They see it as a grown-up occupation. See, if after lunch the mother says, now you have a rest and I'm going to read. And she reads for her own pleasure. See, yes, that is important, because then the children don't think, well, this is just something like a toy train that they do to amuse me. They see it as a grown-up activity, a grown-up pleasure, something that is important to the grown-up, and they all want to do what the adult does. At this age, they are geared to copying the grown-up, and therefore, your children, in their turn, want to read. So read to them a certain amount, look at books with them a certain amount, and read for your own pleasure in front of them. I myself was very lucky in that I had a father who enjoyed literature and uh, I was very fond of him so when he was reading I would climb on his knee and he would just read aloud and I, he would read poetry and uh, I grew up with this great love of poetry and of course it never occurred to me it meant anything <laughs> but it did sound wonderful when he read it. And it's like music, you know, you have to listen to it a good many times before you begin to understand. And I was quite a good age before it occurred to me it meant anything, but I did love having it read to me. So there you are. Now the books we choose then are going to be for the beauty of production, beauty of the pictures, the knowledge that they contain, or the culture, uh, as we can read them poetry. 
And there are some very beautiful books in English. I remember Sunday afternoons, we were a family of seven, so the ages varied, but we all had the Pilgrim's Progress read to us, you see. And I remember how beautiful the language was. We appreciated it. It didn't mean much to me as a, as a book, but the language was so beautiful, you see, that you all did sit and enjoy it. So you don't always have to worry that they are understanding. You read them book for the beauty of the language or the beauty of the poetry. And like music, it begins to mean something. We must choose our books from the point then of good English. So we must only let them hear the best uh, English that is written. It's very important at this age, when they are learning language, that they hear very good English spoken and read. So, when you choose your books, choose them from those point of views. So we always have to think of this culture. And as I say, you have beautiful books that you can get. Now then, the age. What is the best age to begin? When you think of reading, there are many things as the intellectual development, the stage you have reached. There's the language development and the stage you have reached there. And whether you have had parents who read or not, if they do, you begin, I think, around four years of age to have this desire to read yourself. And then uh, the eye-brain development is completely finished, even in the late, with the late ones, and they have enough knowledge, you see. And then they are still in the age for sensorial development, you see, about six this finishes. And I think the actual mechanics of reading are very much a sensorial matter. You see, it depends on the ear, the eye, you see. And the first beginnings of reading are very much a sensorial. And we allied, uh, use touch as well in the beginning, in using the, letter, learning the letters. So we find that between this four plus and six is the age for reading. The children want to read. See, they, uh, the language is sufficiently, or should be sufficiently <coughs> developed. They are tremendously interested in books if they have had the right help, which I have already outlined. And because they're in the sensorial stage, they're going to read much more quickly and much more easily than they will at a later age. But I wouldn't myself begin it before about four years of age or a little after four. So, again, they are still in the age when they are tremendously interested in language. You see, nature says to them, these are the years when you learn language, and so one of the child's main interests is still language. He's absorbing words at a tremendous pace, and while there is this interest in language, the interest in the spoken language transfers very easily to interest in the written language. You see, it's another form of the language. So it seems to me, uh, working with the children, and Dr. Montessori found the same thing, that at this age, the children get avidly interested in learning to read. So that is about the age when we will begin. Myself, I have taught all ages to read. I've done a lot of remedial reading. And I have taught illiterate grown-ups to read. And after six years, 
the, the children, I've always found, take a little longer. And the older they get, the longer they take to learn to read. And if they learn to read at a late age, I have two friends who didn't learn until they were nine years of age. But they both have, they're both very intelligent, they both have first class degrees, one in mathematics, one in biology. But that they are slow readers. And they don't take in the full sense the first time they read a thing. If they read a letter through, they have, may have to read it twice. Whereas people who learn to read at a younger age, I think, going more for total reading. They read more quickly, they take in the sense of what they read the first time they read it. See? And that is another thing that I notice very much with the late readers. But between this four and six, given the right method, the children learn very quickly indeed. But well, now then, if we are going to go into reading at that age, then we have to think of the method we're going to use. Now, originally, of course, all writing was a picture writing. You had a picture, you wanted to say table, you drew a picture of a table. If you wanted to say tree, you drew a picture of a tree. See, And from this, uh, you had to develop an enormous number of pictures. See, people were very uh, clever in the way they devised things. If they wanted a plural, then they drew two. If they wanted to say trees, they drew two trees. Now that two trees stood for uh, two trees in the garden, or a forest, or a jungle. And you had to make up your mind from the sense of what you were reading. You see, as well, it was just you we were talking about two trees or a whole, whole forest. And uh, it's very interesting how they managed. Uh, some, uh, Chinese, of course, is uh, one of the examples. If they uh, wanted to say, have an abstract, like brightness, well, they had a picture of the moon for the moon and the sun for the sun. If they wanted to say brightness, then they put the two together because you could have nothing brighter than the light of the sun and the moon combined, you see? And they built up uh, ideas in this way. If they, they had one symbol for a boy or a young man, another for a girl, and what do you think it meant when they put them together? It didn't mean trouble. <laughs> it, it meant perfection, because there was nothing nicer than having both, you see, and so on. But to write language like this meant something like 10 or more thousand pictures. They've, of course, they've simplified their language recently, but it meant that only a few people could read and write. And languages were written like this <coughs> and uh, were very uh, cumbersome, and only a few people had the time to spend on reading and writing, and then uh, I think it was in Suma that originally they did have one or two uh, symbols which stood for sounds. See? And then the Egyptians who come next, they certainly had a certain number of symbols that stood for the sounds in the language, but a great many that stood for either syllables or the whole picture. And then it was... Uh, we're not absolutely certain who, but certainly it was the Phoenicians that uh, affected it and brought it around the world. They had this wonderful idea of breaking the language into its phonetic sounds and having a picture for each sound. See? Now, their language broke down into 22 consonants and a certain number of vowels, but the vowels occurred at such regular intervals that they didn't worry with the vowels, they just put a dot on the line where a vowel occurred. So I believe they do still in Hebrew. Are any of you Jewish and, and write Hebrew? No. Well, I think they do still. But when they found that instead of these thousands of pictures, they could write the language with only 22 pictures. And that was the amazing breakthrough that made our civilization possible. And this, of course, was spread in different ways. Uh, the Greeks added a few, the Romans they, uh, subtracted a few, 
we added a couple in the Middle Ages and so on. But basically, we still use the same symbols. Uh, they have become very stylized, but you can trace every one of our letters back to the original picture. And it's interesting to do it with the children alongside reading and writing. Well, now, if this is the way our language was written, it seems to me only logical to teach it and hand it on in this way. See? And I think the modern idea that you get the child to recognize a whole word <coughs> as a beginning to reading is like uh, teaching Chinese. You see, there you have to you learn every separate word, because every separate word is a separate picture. But if you have to learn every separate word by sight, you see, then it would take you as long, really, as learning Chinese. It's not a reasonable way to expect children to learn to read and write. And I think that is the basis of the, of the poor reading ability that we have now. Instead, we give the children the phonetic sounds of the letters from the beginning. And from that, they can go to phonetic words. But if you know your, we only need 26 sounds, if you have those 26 sounds, you can, you have a key in which you can tackle any word. Because most of our words are partly phonetic, if not totally phonetic. Now, the history of the English language, again, is an exciting one, and one we should uh, study with the children, parallel to reading and writing. They find it most, most interesting. English, of course, is a language composed of more than one language. Uh, we had uh, the original habits, the habit inhabitants, and then we had the Celts who uh, came and inhabited England, and then we had uh, waves of Anglo-Saxons, Jukes invading us. You're a rich farm country, you know, everybody wanted us always and still do. You know, so we had hordes of invaders from different parts of Northern Europe, each bringing in their own dialect or their own language. And the Celts got driven to Wales, of course, in the mountainous part that nobody really wanted. That, that is still Celtic, and still they speak their own language, which is quite different to English. And we got the Romans who came in, and then we got uh, the Norman conquest, which brought in uh, Latin, the Latin uh, French is a Latin-derived language. And always we got words from the Latin, because Latin was the language of the church. So after we got Christianity, so we've ended up with a mixed language. And you've got the Renaissance and the return to the study of uh, Greek and Roman uh, knowledge and mythology. And uh, then we got our people who went exploring all over the world, and everywhere they went, they brought back new words, and so on. And today we are adding to language all the time in many different ways. Basically, approximately 40% from the Latin, approximately 35% from the Teutonic languages. It was uh, about 2% from the Greek, but that is going up because we have uh, exhausted the Latin from the point of view of classification. And we are now using uh, Greek as our source for classification. If you notice all the new terms like psychology, psychosis, neurosis, all these words come from the Greek. Well now, you can't have so many languages and, uh, as I say, different areas of England were colonized by different people, see, without having many more sounds than there are in the Roman alphabet. It was the Romans who brought the alphabet to us. You see, the, and so we have a great many more sounds. And we could, in the beginning, have made extra symbols, but instead we got our different sounds by combining letters. And every time we want to make that tutorial sound, we put S and H together. 
every time you want the Teutonic th sound, we put T and H together. See? So we have a certain number, and there are not so many really, of combinations of letters which give us new sounds and which the children will have to learn. But it's not very many. And then for many reasons, which we can't really go into without going into a more detailed study of the language, we have many irregularities. And these the children do, for the most part, take in through reading. If you have an irregular word in the middle of a sentence, it could only make sense there, and they can usually uh, guess the word by the context, see, or half the word is regular, see? And, and so those, if they learn to read young, and they're still in that sensorial stage when they take in through the eye and the ear, and they read, when they first find they can read, they read a tremendous amount, you don't really have to teach spelling. In fact, the less you teach spelling, the better because they take it in by eye. If they learn to read later, when they're past that sensorial stage, then they do not take in spelling by eye, and they often remain very poor spellers. But the more you worry them about spelling, you set up this anxiety, and then you make a bad spell. Whereas left to themselves, they would be good spellers. <coughs> But just to cheer you up, we have something like over 20,000 irregularities. Well, it's a rich language. See, partly because we, uh, before the days of travel, we all got our own dialects in different places. Partly pronunciation has changed through the centuries, and so on. And you have the same thing here. You have very different ways of pronouncing words in different parts of the country. I have the most trouble when I go to uh, the south, I go to Mobile and New Orleans and Alabama. It seems to me they only have one vowel there, but <laughs> maybe me. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, quite difficult, yeah, it's very, very difficult. And then over on the other coast, they speak very much more as we speak in, in, in England. But in different parts of England, you would find people speaking with a very different accent. The further north you go, the more phonetic the language becomes. Personally, I'm from the south, so we very proudly say we speak the King's English, just because the court happened to be in the south. So I think about four years of age, we would start the reading scheme, or just after but not before, and varying a little with the children, but on the whole, you would find all children would be ready for it then. And some of them go into it who have come from these more cultured homes, go into it with this tremendous enthusiasm, and if you have one or two who are enthusiastic, then the ones who come from homes where they haven't had such a good background they catch the enthusiasm from everybody else, and your whole class goes madly into reading. And I always found that they, once they started this work, they went into it with terrific enthusiasm and achieved reading very quickly. See, I've had many children who learned to read in a semester, and most of them would learn within a year to read fluently, to be able to pick up any book within their comprehension and read. And we would certainly expect them all to be reading by six, reading fluently. And we are very keen on it. Everyone talks about independence. In fact, I think in many ways, uh, sometimes independence is thrust on children before they're ready for it. Again, it's something that we have to go carefully and understand the stages of development. Of course, by five, you have reached, uh, achieved many steps in independence. But it's not happy if you, you are, if too much is expected of you. 
But reading is the big step in mental independence. Very important that you can read. If you're interested in many subjects, you ask the grown-ups questions, and they can't, naturally, they can't answer you many times, and they don't always have time, but you can always, they can always give you a book. And they can always tell you where you can get the knowledge for yourself. See? And so, once you can read, you can. You are independent. You can get the knowledge for yourself, read the stories or the poems you like yourself. See? And you can be educated. Because unless you can read, you can't be educated. Now, if, when thinking of how to teach reading, Dr. Montessori also broke it up into its component difficulties. See? She did realize that uh, to write is something which is very skilled. Your hand has to be well trained. If you've ever tried to teach an awkward child of five or six to write, you would realize that they can hardly hold the pencil. Yeah, I expect some of you have. By five, the hand should be obeying the will. It should have had reached this marvelous stage, and you, went, you can do anything with it that you want to. And this, again, depends on how much help the child has been given. And in the Montessori school, everything the child does when he's handling the material and so on, the teacher shows him how to handle it without, you know, such a way that he's going to gain skill with his hands. And he's had things with little knobs on that uh, fitting things, so those two fingers and thumb, the ones that use handle or pencil, that handle most tools, are uh, co co coordinating well together, see. So we, there is this pre-training of the hand, not only from the point of writing, but for the point of being able to do anything you want with your hands. And then we don't really, two things again I think are going rather badly wrong with us. We are, we are allowing the manufacturers to sell us all sorts of things which they call educational. Educational toys is the big business now, isn't it? So almost everything you buy for your child has letters or numbers all over it. You see, building blocks, even cushions I've seen made like the letters of the elderly. Well, you scatter these bricks about on the nursery floor, or these little boxes of letters, or this cushion, you see it upside down, you see it backwards, and I find today that many of our children by fall have got reversal problems. Not that there's anything wrong with their eyes, but simply because they've been used to seeing the letters upside down and backwards and so on. You see? So I think all these, giving them these letters and things so young, unless we ensure that they see them the right way up all the time, is very bad. If we want them to have the letters, we, it would be a good thing to have them beautifully written as a frieze on the wall. See, but very beautifully written. And then they would see them, they would see that they were lovely, that we thought they were important, and they would see them the right way up. I do think, too, they're being given pencils almost as soon as they can hold one and being just allowed to scribble. See? And they don't uh, hold the pencil properly, they hold it in any way they can. And uh, so again, at the time they come to this reading, writing, they are really a bit fed up with it. So, now, we must always see that they hold the pencil properly. And if you have a child coming to school who holds his pencil the wrong way, you have to do, spend a lot of time correcting this. And every time he goes back to his bad habit, you just have to walk down and replace the pencil the right way. Because if you hold your, any tool, when you first learn to use any tool, you must learn to use it the right way. See, and if you hold the pencil the right way, 
you can get all these lines in any direction, very fluid lines, but if you hold it the wrong way, you can only get a few rigid lines. So well, if you hold it in any of these odd ways. So first we train the hand, and then in order to give them dexterity with a pencil, we have a very interesting exercise that they will enjoy, which I will show you this afternoon, because there isn't time to do it now. See? And then we teach the letters separately, using touch, sight, and hearing, and so on. So we teach one sort of difficulty at a time, or one part of the reading scheme. Now, uh, this afternoon, I will show you the exercise that we do for using skill, for gaining skill with a pencil. And then you, I shall have paper here. If any of you have colored pencils, bring them with you. I have got uh, one box you can use. Or you can do the drawings and color them at home. I shall give you a series of exercises. All right? Well, now, I've allowed 10 minutes in case you have any questions. Would you repeat the percentage, uh, the percentages on the percentages of Well, it's approximate, you know, because it changes as we add words. Mm -hmm. But it's approximately 40% from the Latin languages. Now, that is directly from the Latin all from the Latin via Norman French when we had the Norman invasion. See? Uh, when for a time England was bilingual. And uh, that is why we have so many words which are so nearly alike in meaning. And you see, well, we have two words. I mean, it was the Saxons who did the farm work, so for or most of the farm animals you have a Saxon word like sheep. And then when it comes to the table, you have the Norman French word, mutton, you see. But it gives us a very rich language. Then approximately 35% from the Teutonic languages. These were the waves of people from Northern Europe, Denmark, Scandinavia, that came and uh, took over sections of the country. And it was 2% from the Greek, but that is rising a little. And then we, I think we must have words from every language in the globe. And then, of course, uh, we are busy inventing words. At what age do you think a child should be introduced to a pencil? Well, there's so much that is important for them. It's a little difficult to say because, you know, if you have older brothers and sisters who use them, you use them. And there's a certain amount. We do less artwork than most people, but there is a certain amount. But, uh, so it does, uh, I mean, you can't say no if a child has a, if a two and a half year old has a brother of six who's drawing. You can't say no, you can't use a pencil. But you would see he held it the right way. And you don't sort of kneel down in reference at every bit of scribble they do. Um, I'm interested in how you would see the role of, of using art tools in comparison to using a pencil. Um, take, for example, painting with fairly large brushes that would really allow a child to grasp it the same way they can grasp a pencil. Um, well, there is a different way of handling any tool, isn't there? He's using a screwdriver. I don't expect him to use it the way he would use a pencil. So you feel that those could be parallel activities? Oh, yes. Tools oh, yes. Wouldn't interfere with all, I, all I'm saying is whenever we teach the use of it, whenever a child uses a tool, we do expect him to be taught the right handling of the tool. Because you will never get a good result if you don't. So if you cut with scissors, you need to be, know how to use your scissors. And you would have all sorts of exercises just for learning to cut with scissors. But you would see he used them the right way. 
I mean, how they love to have their father if he's doing any carpentry. But I would always show them to put the piece of wood in a vice, how to hold the saw properly, how to saw to a line. From the beginning, you would give this in basic instruction that it will afterwards enable you really to create. And if we are, you, if we are learning any new skill, we need to first use the, learn to use the right way of using any new instruments, then, or we can't create, not to a high standard. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. You mentioned the phrase total reading earlier. Could you elaborate on that just a little bit? Yes, well, I shall be elaborating on it as I show you the materials. But this total reading is reading with full understanding, taking in the meaning the first time you read, if possible. Reading with appreciation of, of the reading matter interest in what you are reading, you know, uh, reading what is worthwhile, reading for knowledge, and for the best in literature, and then reading with appreciation of the way the author is using words, you see, because every writer uses words differently. You think of a few of them. I, I, of course, think of the English. Uh, I said the Pilgrim's Progress was one of the most beautiful books in our language. And the St. James Version of the Bible is another most beautiful book. And they, if you notice, use a preponderance of Saxon words. <coughs> See, but they are very beautiful <coughs> books. If you read uh, Browning, he is a very active writer, you'll find he uses a great many adverbs and verbs. If you read Scott, he has long passages with masses of adjectives. So I always skip those, but at the time they were very much admired. Well, you do, and you are aware, you see, of the style of the author and how he is using words. This is more, so sort of what you might call more cultural reading. And if you find yourself reading a badly written book, you simply can't read it, because it offends your sort of feeling. All right, then. So uh, would you like an hour to have a rest in your lunch? And we meet again, at, say, at 1 o'clock?